All right. Let's get started. Let's let some people in here. All right. Hi, everyone. Zoom is being, um, Zoom is doing that weird thing where it tells me my audio is not working. But you guys are saying hi, so I assume you can hear me. Awesome. All right, so, um, we're still getting some more people trickling in. Um, and we still have a little bit of time before we have to begin. Awesome. Yes, excellent. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just wait a moment. Uh, get the slides ready. Roughly picking up. Today, the, today the plan is to um, sort of uh, pick up where we left off. We didn't quite finish chapter one in our last lecture. So I want to do a little recap and then we'll pick up on slide 13, which is just prior to where we left it, if my memory serves me. Uh, and then we will uh, just continue on, finish our previous set of slides and then go on to the next set and finish the chapter. And of course, all these slides are available on Brightspace. Um, so you can download them now to follow along or download them after and just follow along by watching my screen. Okay, so we'll wait a few more minutes because people tend to, when it's an online class, I find that generally from five minutes before to five minutes after is when people, people show up. So, okay, let's prepare this. Come on, slideshow. From current slide. All right. Right. So, uh, one quick, uh, one quick bit of housekeeping. Um, if I'm not mistaken, next week. Oh, sorry. That's my dog. Uh, next week uh, is when the first reading response is due on the 21st, if I'm not mistaken. No, the 28th. Yeah, the 28th. So next Friday is when it's due. And uh, I think what I'll probably do for our next class before we get into the second chapter is I'll tell you a little bit about this assignment. I'll tell you what's... Uh, what's expected of you in a little bit more detail. I'll give you some tips and tricks. Um, uh, I'll kind of uh, walk you through what I think you should do with the template that I've provided on Brightspace. So I'll provide some guidance and we'll spend, I don't know, maybe, maybe 15 or 20 minutes uh, talking about the critical response. And then we'll go on to begin the second chapter. And of course, the second chapter is all about what technology is. The second chapter is, is entitled, What is Technology? Defining or Characterizing Technology, right? So that's what we'll start with next time. Now, what time is it? 11.37. Maybe we'll slowly get started here. Uh, and, you know, people will arrive and uh, we'll just carry on. Okay. So where did we leave it last time? Well, last time we were discussing um, the philosophy of science. And, and remember, Duzik started this chapter off by kind of remarking how um, nobody was really doing philosophy of technology up until the 20th century, um, which is curious. Uh, people were doing philosophy of science, though. 
Um, and where we start, uh, or where we started was with Bacon, right? Uh, Bacon is the father of the scientific method, uh, or so-called father of the scientific method. And he pioneered something called inductivism, where science is just, of course, all about using inductive reasoning. Now, by way of recap, and since there was a lot of interesting discussion last time, I'm going to kick the ball over to the class, and I'd like a volunteer uh, to explain inductivism and inductive reasoning. Um, just, uh, just to sort of recap these, these concepts quickly for the class. So if you'd like to do that, you can raise your hand in the video, or you can just uh, mention, you know, say your piece in the chat here. Max, go ahead. Okay, um, maybe incorrect, but isn't inductive reasoning when you don't have like an assumption or theory beforehand, and your observation remark comes from your literal like inductive observation so like step one is like observation and then step two is like making some kind of like abstraction from that whereas yeah. like deducting is like having an idea and then like looking to like confirm or deny it yeah um uh, yeah i think you've captured the um the sort of empirical aspect right um because uh induction was famously advocated for by the british empiricists um deduction which is reasoning from principles use, using the intellect is uh is more of a rationalist thing right but induction is all about uh reasoning generally from specific cases and my example last time was the was the white swans right if you if every swan you ever encounter in nature is white and you generalize all swans are white from your observation you're using induction and of course, all it would take to refute your generalization is to encounter one swan of a different color, say black, right? Deduction is more like, um, you know, your classic syllogistic examples, right? Um, uh, or, 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 or the way that we define things like triangles and bachelors and, you know, statements like all bachelors are single are necessarily true, right? This is deduction, right? And, uh, and what Bacon does is he kind of turns this into an early version of the scientific method. But as we saw, there were problems with this. Um, Hume's problem, or the problem with induction, right? Does anybody remember Hume's problem? I'll kick the ball over to the class again, just to get some participation happening. Dula, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, perfect. So um, I remember one of the problems with um, inductivism was that um, basically it was the problem of the justification of induction, I think it was called. And basically we use it out of like custom and habit rather than actually because of the fact that it's justified. Right, which, which basically means that the justification we use for using induction, that it's worked in the past, is itself a, an appeal to induction. Right, so it's a circle. So we can't have that, says David Hume. So that's one of the problems with deduction, or with uh, with induction. Sorry, I'm trying not to get these mixed up in my head. So, um, so after that, we got to the logical positivists in the Vienna Circle, and remember, these guys are the um, are the folks that will go on to really, I guess, um, contribute. In, 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 a, in a really, really substantial way to what would come to be known as um, analytic philosophy or Anglo-American philosophy, which is ironic because most of these thinkers actually come from the continent, uh, right? This is one, this is just one reason why I think the whole analytic continental division is uh, just kind of silly. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a rant for another time. So the Vienna Circle comes along and uh, they try to make philosophy a lot like science. Uh, they're, they're, they're the positivists. Um, they kind of, um, you know, only want to talk about things that they can directly observe. Um, all, uh, everything else is meaningless to a logical positivist. Uh, claims about um, religion 
or even politics to a logical positivist are meaningless and therefore why are, why talk about them uh, right and and positivism eventually led to something that we called logical empiricism and that gave rise to verificationism the next big sort of uh, sort of turn in the philosophy of science verificationism as the name suggests verificationism is all about verifying um, you know statements we can formulate statements propositions right statements about the world statements that can have a truth value and how science works if you're a logical empiricist or a verificationist is that you can actually go out and verify the truth of that statement right if i utter the proposition it snowed a lot yesterday well i can verify that if i want i can check the weather records right i can go look outside right i mean look at all that snow out there i can verify this right but you know other things like god is good i cannot verify because god whether you believe in god or not whether god exists or not god is unobservable we can't verify anything so logical empiricists yeah we just want to verify stuff but Along comes Karl Popper with kind of a, a, a twist on things. Does everybody remember what that twist was? Instead of verificationism, uh, like those in the Vienna School advocated for, Karl Popper comes along and advocates what? Yes, falsification, that's right. Stefan, I hope I'm uh, saying this correctly. Uh, yes, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Vince, Vincent or Vincente. Uh, I hope I pronounce everybody's names right. I'm sorry if I get people's names wrong, but uh, it's not quite regularity. It's, uh, it's falsification. Instead of verifying you know, the, tr the, the truth of propositions about the world, instead of checking facts, what we're actually trying to do is disprove those law-like generalizations, our laws and our theories, we're constantly trying to falsify them, right? Remember the example that we talked about, uh, I think to, to a pretty good extent last time was uh, special and general relativity. Special and general relativity conceived of by Albert Einstein. Um, and those theories were tested back in the day in the early 20th century when Einstein proposed them, but we're still testing them now. We're still trying to prove them wrong, and we've failed to prove them wrong. So those kinds of statements for Popper, law-like generalizations that we cannot falsify, those are the most scientific statements. We do have to still verify facts, right? We have to go out and observe things and see how the world is. But that's not uh, the most scientific thing. That's just like sort of the groundwork. Um, the most scientific stuff happens at the level of like laws and theories and experimentation that's directed at trying to falsify uh, what those theories predict. And that's the most scientific thing. Then we left off here real quick. And I just want to recap this entire slide because we're going to come back to realism, anti-realism and um, instrumental realism by the end of the chapter, and instrumental realism is interesting. But to understand that, we need to recap these. So what does Duzik say about realism? Realism is also known as um, essentialism, scientific realism. If you're a scientific realist, you're an essential, essentialist. And you believe, quote, that the theoretical terms in science represent or refer to objectively real entities, even if we cannot observe them. Anti-realists claim that the theoretical terms are not to be taken literally, uh, or not to be taken to literally refer to objects or entities. So if you think of a theoretical term like electron, uh, electrons, uh, if you're a scientific realist or, or an essentialist, electrons are objectively real. But if you're an anti-realist, you probably think of electrons as theoretical tools. 
It doesn't literally refer to something that exists in the world or a type of thing that exists in the world, but it allows us to make predictions about the world. And uh, it works, right? There's a certain amount of scientific pragmatism going on here, right? It works. It may not give us a literal picture of how the world is, but it allows us nonetheless to explain the world. So that's what the anti-realists or the instrumentalists are all about. Whereas the realists say, no, electrons are real, right? So, um, yeah, one way that I like to think of this is that uh, realists are thinking of theories as pictures of the natural world. Instrumentalists think of them as tools or instruments uh, for making predictions about the world, hence instrumentalism. Now, these don't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, they, they kind of came together during the Renaissance where we had scholars um, you know, the, on, the, on the theoretical side of things um, and uh, artisans on the more practical side of things coming together in this sort of marriage of metaphysics and technology. And we, you know, we have this sort of romanticized idea of the Renaissance man that kind of you know, represents this, right? Like think of somebody like Leonardo da Vinci who was both um, an artist and an engineer, right? So <laughs> the coming together of the theoretical and the practical. So that's where we left off last time. Um, next, we got to talk about Thomas Kuhn, if my slides will. Oh, there we go. Ah. Oh, oh my goodness. My computer is terribly, terribly slow. Right. Go on. I'm afraid that if I push the button again, it'll... Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. So... Kuhn's work is really interesting. Um, Popper's, and, and I think this is actually the slide we left it at last time, but Popper's falsification was one um, alternative to the approach that the positivists had adopted. But another, maybe even more famous approach is Kuhn's. Kuhn's was actually, uh, Kuhn was actually trained as a physicist. He had um, uh, an undergrad and two graduate degrees, his master's of science and PhD were in physics. Um, but he valued academic freedom and actually spent a lot of his time teaching about the history and philosophy of science. Um, and that's why he approached the philosophy of science from a sort of historical perspective, right? Um, so skip to the next slide, get myself out of the way. One of the interesting things that Dusik says about Kuhn here on page 13 is this, quote, Kuhn was puzzled by Aristotle's physics, which seemed totally nonsense to someone trained in modern physics. One afternoon, while he was gazing from his dorm window out, of, out on the trees of Harvard Yard, the scales fell from his eyes, and he realized that Aristotle's claims made perfect sense within a framework totally different from the modern one. This framework, I say on the slides in my second point, is what Thomas Kuhn called a paradigm. You've probably heard of a paradigm. You've probably heard the term or the turn of phrase paradigm shift, and that's due to Kuhn. So let's talk about Kuhn's sort of uh, eureka moment here. What's going on here? He's puzzled by Aristotle's physics. Who can tell me a little bit about Aristotle's physics, by the way? We got any fans of ancient philosophy here? I want to volunteer and describe a little bit of Aristotle's physics. If so, you can raise your hand or just, uh, just let me know in the chat. Yeah, basic elements. Okay, Zach, yeah. Uh, Maxine, you know, is politics but not as physics. That's okay. It's all teleology anyway, whether we're talking humans or rocks, right? So um, yeah, there's different kinds of causes. Okay, so yeah, we're getting to it. Yeah, so Zach says there's four basic elements and everything's made of different percentages of them. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, Aristotle uh, thinks of elements, uh, you know, like fire, earth, water, air. These are elements for Aristotle, right? There's different kinds of causes. That's right. Aristotle's theory of causality is different than our own. I like to call our understanding of causality now, or the way we think about causality now, as sort of like 
billiard ball causality. You know, like David Hume talking about causality. You know, the cue stick strikes the cue ball, which strikes the eight ball, which goes into the corner pocket, right? A causes B, causes C, causes D. We, that's how we think of causality now or how we're, we're used to thinking of it. But Aristotle has four causes. He has your material cause. What is something made of? Um, the formal cause. What form does it take? The efficient cause. What brings it into being? And the final cause or the telos. What is its purpose or end? Right? So those are the four causes. Yeah, water, earth, fire, and air. That's right. So Aristotle sounds like uh, nonsense to a modern physicist. Uh, you know, uh, how does Aristotle explain why things fall? You know, nowadays we have gravity, right? If I have an object, an object right here, and I drop it, gravity, right? No, no big deal. Um, and Newton understood gravity as a, as a force, a force that acts on objects that are, that, are, that are in the force field. Later, Einstein comes and says, well, actually, gravity is the bending of space time. So now I'm, in, I'm on Earth. I'm in the Earth's gravity well. And this is falling down the gravity well. Same as how gravity is keeping me stuck to the surface of the Earth. But like Zach says in the chat, yeah, Aristotle would say things are meant to fall, so they fall. If I've got something like a rock or something that goes on the ground, well, it's, its end, its telos, it, where it wants to be is on the ground. It just wants to be there. That's its end. So it's just got to kind of go there, given the opportunity. Other things, they're, they're meant to, to go up, right? Like heat, right? So this is how Aristotle understood the world. And yeah, to a modern scientist, this seems absolutely ridiculous. But it wasn't ridiculous to Aristotle. And that's because Aristotle was working uh, in, in, in what to be, what, 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 what Kuhn would call a different paradigm, right? Yeah, Emily, you're right, yeah. The acorn's telos is to be a tree. That's right. And everything is about uh, ends and, and form and matter, hylomorphism. It's all, Aristotle's metaphysics are actually really complicated. It's really tricky stuff, really complicated. And yeah, we know it's wrong now. But if you were at the Lyceum, and you had Aristotle as your pro philosophy professor, and you read his logical, systematic works that seem to describe the way the world works, you know, that, that you can see with your own eyes. Because uh, Aristotle's really, he's not like 100% an empiricist, but he's definitely more of an empiricist than his teacher Plato was. Um, you know, this does make sense. Like, we know it's wrong now, but if you didn't know any better, yeah, Aristotle's uh, metaphysics, his physics, would totally explain why acorns turn into oak trees and why rocks fall when we let go of them. It totally makes sense within the framework that Aristotle was working with. So this is what Kuhn calls a paradigm. Aristotle had a different paradigm than Isaac Newton, and Isaac Newton was working within a different paradigm than Einstein, or, or rather, rather, these figures all kind of shifted their paradigms, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so another thing that's interesting about this, um, about Kuhn's view, is that, you know, we, we have the Vienna Circle, which treats scientific theories as these sort of static structures you know, almost like concepts. You could think of them almost like concepts. Kuhn treats them as ways of looking at the world. It includes not only theories, which, you know, the Vienna Circle uh, is, is treating theories like static structures, concepts, or I suppose like logical, logical um, formulae where you have, um, I don't know, some axioms, some rules, and then some reasoning. That's your scientific theory. Kuhn includes that as, as, long, as well as, quote, tacit skills of laboratory practice that are not recorded and are taught by imitation of an expert practitioner. 
What does that mean? Well, for example, when I was doing my PhD research, um, we used uh, virtual reality to run some experiments on people. We did a user study, basically, and we had to hook people up to the Oculus Rift. It was quite fun. It was really cool to be able to use gadgets um, to do science. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It gives you an appreciation for what's being talked about here. But anyway, uh, the Vienna Circle would not include my um, picking up the skills on how to work with an experimental participant using this headset as part of what science is, right? Only the, only the psychological facts of the matter, if there are psychological facts, right? Psychology is kind of um, a weird science because psychology doesn't identify laws. Psychology identifies effects. But we can talk about that at some other time. But anyway, that's the scientific stuff. My, um, my sort of like experimenter participant interaction skills are something else. The Vienna Circle would not treat that as science. Kuhn would. He would say, this is something that scientists working in this paradigm have to do. Psychologists, if you're going to strap someone into a virtual reality device, you have to be very mindful of their personal space. You have to let them know what you're doing in the real world because they can't see what you're doing. You have to be very attentive in case somebody develops a case of uh, simulator sickness or something, right? These are all very specific to the lab that I was working in, which used virtual reality for different kinds of psychological experiments. And this is the kind of thing that Kuhn would include in uh, in, in, uh, in science, in theoretical, uh, in, in science. Um, science is a way of viewing the world which includes practice and theory, which is really cool. And paradigms also feature these ideals about what a good scientific theory amounts to and um, a sort of metaphysics, right? Uh, we don't get rid of metaphysics like the positivists did. We have a metaphysics of what kinds of basic entities exist. Aristotle had a metaphysics. I mean, <laughs> Aristotle invented metaphysics, man. Like <laughs> Aristotle had his four elements, his theory of causality, uh, hylomorphism, the sort of matter formness, entelechy, right? There are all of these uh, concepts in Aristotle's metaphysics that tell us what exists and how it works. And we have these two physicists even if they're, they don't want to admit it, they have metaphysics, right? In fact, physics, I like to think of physics, modern day physics, modern day theoretical physics, it's kind of just like metaphysics with math. You know, if you ask a, a physicist, hey, what kinds of things exist? Um, they'll tell you, well, uh, there are certain fundamental particles that exist, right? You got your you got your quarks and your muons and gluons and and then uh, you've got your protons and neutrons and electrons uh you know all these fundamental particles and everything's made out of those there are forces there are fundamental forces as well those exist right so that's metaphysics i mean i know it's always talked about as physics but it's metaphysics it's 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 what exists and what is it like, right? So uh, that's a little. Whoops. Goodness, my computer is terrible. All right. So, quoting from page 14, Duzik writes Kuhn also tied the paradigm to the structure of the scientific community. The paradigm binds the researchers in a scientific specialty, channeling their experimental and theoretical practice in certain directions and defining good scientific theory and practice. Later, Kuhn distinguished between paradigms as exemplars, models for good scientific theory and practice, such as the works of Galileo, Newton, or Einstein, and the paradigm as disciplinary matrix or belief system shared by members of the scientific community. <clears throat> Now, uh, another interesting point about Kuhn is that he doesn't think that either induction or falsification, and I, I suppose verification as well, describes the fall of paradigms or rather the shifts of paradigms. Why? 
Well, that's because we can easily modify theories and hypotheses if they're refuted by evidence. So refutations to, to certain theories um, aren't fatal to, to a particular paradigm. And this is also known as the Duhem thesis or Duhem thesis. I wonder if we can come up with an example. Can we come up with an example of a discovery that undermines a theory, but which doesn't cause a paradigm to fall? or to change. First of all, let's, let's work out what, where, what are our paradigms. Aristotelian physics and metaphysics is certainly one paradigm. I would say that Newtonian physics is another paradigm. And general relativity, quantum mechanics are a further development of, of that paradigm. So just so that we know where the borders are here, can we think of any examples of theories that are refuted and then modified such that they're not fatal, uh, such, that, such that they can survive under the current paradigm? If we've got any people who are fans of physics, um, you might think, think of Newton versus versus, think of Newton versus Einstein. Okay, I'll give you an example. So Newton came up in Principia Mathematica, which is, which is generally considered to be the thing that, the work that uh, ends the scientific revolution and kind of, um, you know, it's the end of the beginning of modern physics. And Newton offers things like, you know, laws of motion, right? Newton's got laws of motion. Those are great. They tell us how things move. Very handy. But they don't tell us how everything moves, right? They could tell us how stuff works on Earth in what phys physicists call like middle world where nothing is too big or too small, right? Oh, that's a really cool example. Um, that's really cool. Uh, I'll come back to that one, but that is a really cool example, Tess. Uh, what I, my example is that, um, so Newton's laws of motion, you know, take, take, for example, maybe the most famous one, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Um, you know, this works fine on Earth, um, but it doesn't describe things very well uh, when we're dealing with um, large, large, like cosmically large masses or like cosmically high speeds, right? Yes, Zach got it. Inertia only works in an inertial reference frame. Yeah. So that, and that's what Einstein kind of showed with, with relativity. That's why it's called relativity, right? Um, he showed that, you know, reference frames are a thing. And, um, you know, it's not like, it's not like we've done away with Newtonian physics. We still use it for a lot of stuff, but there are some things we can't use it for. If we want to know what happens when we're traveling, say, close to the speed of light or slingshotting around a supermassive black hole, uh, we need relativity for that because Einstein's theories uh, work for those phenomena. Newton's don't. But that doesn't mean that we get rid of Newton, right? Um, we can still kind of use it. It still survives under the modern paradigm. And just to go back to Tess's example, uh, this is really interesting uh, because, yeah, the, this was sort of a bit, there was a bit of competition here um, for a while. A lot of people don't realize this, but um, when Copernicus came along and proposed the, um, Newton is way easier to use when you're working in a reference frame. Yeah, it's been a while since I've actually done any physics, so I'm going to take your word for it. But yeah, I mean, um, uh, epicycles to the geocentric model. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the geocentric model needed to, explain, um, needed to explain 
retrograde motion. So uh, Ptolemy was very famous for advocating a model like this. Ptolemy was, a, was an ancient scientist. Um, and he, he had this very complicated model of, you know, wheels within wheels moving around called epicycles to explain the retrograde motion that was observed uh, for certain planets. Um, when Copernicus, hundreds of years later, proposed the heliocentric model, first of all, Copernicus may have been inspired by, um, I believe it was Aristarchus of Samos, and he was an ancient Greek thinker. So, I mean, how's that for a paradigm? right there, ancient Greeks talking about um, Earth orbiting the sun. Pretty crazy, right? But anyway, uh, Ptolemy adds these things. Um, Copernicus proposes the heliocentric model. And, and, and the interesting fact is that um, both of these models accounted for the observed data equally well. A lot of people don't realize that when, uh, that when, um, Copernicus proposed his model, it wasn't an immediate like, oh, of course, it, this explains the data better. No, both of these models actually worked just as well as each other. And it wasn't until Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, Brahe had the observations, Kepler was the theoretician, and Kepler worked out that planets don't orbit in circles, they orbit in ellipses. And this could explain the retrograde motion. And he did this with laws of nature that uh, would, would inspire what Galileo and Newton would go on to do. He, he came up with his three laws of planetary motion. When Newton said, we see far because we stand on the shoulders of giants, he was talking about Kepler. So, you know, always remember. So that's a really cool example. Uh, but yeah, once Kepler did that, then the geocentric model could not survive under the new paradigm and it died. Um, I mean, or, or maybe, maybe there are some flat earthers who are still into it. I don't know. I mean, you never know. You wouldn't think flat earthers would be a thing in our modern paradigm, but, but they, but they're there. <laughs> so that's the 2M thesis. Now, Go on to the next slide. How are we doing for time? Not bad, not bad at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, the sad thing is about uh, the sad thing about the flat earthers is that they don't understand that 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 they don't understand why it's not science, right? Uh, you know, they, they don't they don't understand the difference between science and pseudoscience. And it's and it's sad. I think it's sad. But yeah, anything is valid. Ice walls. Um, water always finds its level. Like, that's what they always say. Water always finds its level, man. Uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I've seen I've seen Stefan. I've seen I've seen that. Th there's a documentary where they get that. They got some kind of very complicated laser laser sighting apparatus and they set it up and 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 it proves the earth is a sphere and they're like oh there must be something wrong with our instruments or, or something like it it's it's wacky i i mean it's wacky if you want to know how not to do science you just, just talk to a flat earther so anyway enough about that nonsense let's continue um so like i said you know uh, paradigms don't collapse when we falsify a theory or when we fail to verify a fact or a, or a theory. Um, it's the accumulation of anomalies, rather, what Kuhn calls, calls anomalies. Anomalies are phenomena that don't fit the categories of the paradigm. Anomalies are things that the theories within your paradigm cannot explain. And I'm going to give you an interesting example something that's kind of close to my, my area of interest. Um, there's a, there's a, everybody's heard of parapsychology. Yes. Parapsychology. Um, parapsychology is very interesting. Parapsychology began in earnest 
I, I'd say it began in earnest as a genuine attempt to investigate whether there are uh, psi phenomena, you know, ESP and uh, psychokinesis and stuff like this, right? Prior to this, there was an area of research called um, called spiritualism, right, which was really big in the UK and in America. Uh, spiritualism or psychical research, as it's also sometimes called, would try to uh, identify people with psychic powers and study them, you know? And a lot of scientists were seriously into the idea that this, this stuff was for real. Parapsychology comes along and says, um, we're not going to do it that way. We, we need to make this more like a science. So Joseph Banks Ryan and Louisa Ryan at Duke University start the first parapsychology laboratory. And they study uh, just regular people, not people who claim to be mediums or psychics or whatever. They study regular people. And they find some interesting stuff in the data that suggests, oh, maybe there's something going on here. But with better computers, better statistical tools, better tools for statistical analysis, we saw that there is really nothing going on. There does not seem to be any kind of ESP or, or, or psychokinesis, it doesn't seem to exist. But weird stuff does happen, right? So what does psychology do? Well, parapsychology is kind of on its way out, but uh, an interesting other branch of psychology is called anomalistic psychology. And they like to investigate these so-called anomalistic experiences, experiences that um, seem to violate keyword seem to violate principles of naturalism. So an anomalistic psychologist is going to study uh, a case of somebody believing they've had a, um, an encounter with a ghost or, 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 or alien abduction or something paranormal. These are anomalous experiences, um, but we can nonetheless explain them, right? So that's an anomaly in, in, in the sense of the word that I like to discuss it is something that doesn't quite fit with experience doesn't jive, it, it's out of the ordinary. It's not necessarily spooky or supernatural. It just needs explaining. Anomalies in, in, in paradigms are kind of similar. They don't have to be, they don't have to have anything to do with something spooky or weird, but there's something that we can't explain with the tools that we've got. And if there are enough anomalies under a paradigm, then it becomes apparent that the paradigm cannot explain what it needs to explain, right? Yeah, that, that, that might be an anomaly, right? Yeah, like, so like Dane says, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. The more the universe expands, the faster it seems to go. And this does not make any sense, right? Given what we know. I mean, things should slow down over time right? Not speed up. Like if I, um, here's an example, simple example. I got a, I got my fidget spinner right here. If I get it going, it'll spin, but it should start to slow down. Yeah, it's going slower. If I turn it up and down like this, it slows faster and get rid of some of that, some of that momentum and it slows down. But the universe doesn't do that. Well, okay, here's, here's, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. Dane, Dane brings up a good point. And maybe, maybe there's just something that we don't understand that's driving that expansion, like dark energy or dark matter, right? Maybe as Zach says, we can explain this with quantum, um, quantum physics, right? But here's the thing about that. Quantum physics is itself not a complete explanation of nature. Quantum physics works for a certain uh, domain of phenomena, right? Quantum physics works at the quantum level. Special and general relativity work at the, the cosmic level, we'll call it, where we're going very fast or, or dealing with incredible mass. And these two are not compatible with one another. 
We need to, we have yet to unify them, right? And there's, there's some ways we're exploring that might allow us to do that. You know, there's string theory, there's quantum gravity. Uh, there's a number of different um, ways that we might be able to unify them. But that's it, but it is interesting, you know, sure we can explain it with quantum physics, but does that really get rid of the anomaly if, if, if quantum physics is not a complete paradigm? I guess we just have to wait and see, right? So, and of course, <laughs> Dane, yeah, um, it's always important, you know, I, I got to mention, you know, I'm not a physicist, I'm an astronomy nerd, but I'm not a physicist. And also physicists themselves will tell you that if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics, right? So quantum physics is very weird. So don't worry if, if some of the things that come up in the chat seem not to make sense. Um, so when we have enough anomalies, when we have a sufficient number of anomalies uh, that don't fit the category of the paradigm, that's when we have to start thinking about rejecting the paradigm or having a paradigm shift. As Duzik says, a paradigm is rejected only after a new paradigm has arisen. And there is a shift of allegiance of scientists. At one point, Kuhn quotes the physicist Max Planck as saying that it is a matter of the older generation dying off. <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah. Oh, Dula, yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm always confused by quantum physics. I don't do, I don't, I don't mess with any of the math. Um, but when you read about some of the thought experiments or even some of the actual experiments, like, you know, the double slit Schrodinger's cat, it's very weird. It's very weird. But a lot of the reason why quantum physics is so weird is, I suppose, is because um, when, you're ex when, when, when a physicist is trying to explain quantum physics to a non-physicist, they have to use examples that are, you know, that, that, that like Leonard Susskind says that we grok, you know, like grok is this, um, this term that Robert Heinlein uses in some of the science fiction books where people say like, oh, I grok that. It means I get it. Like I just intuitively understand it. We grok, we grok things in this level of existence where things aren't too big or too small. And when you need to explain quantum mechanics, you know, like think of Schrodinger's cat, you need to use things in your thought experiment that we can grok, like cats and radioactive decay and timers and boxes, right? But in the quantum world, it's all electrons and protons and neutrons and photons and things, right? So. That's another reason why it can be weird, because uh, we're trying to 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 give illustrate to to illustrate this stuff with with stuff that the quantum doesn't apply to. So I don't know. Anyway, I like this quote or this description of Max Planck saying that a paradigm shift is really a matter of the older generation dying off, and um, um, once you get to, to know, knowing the state of other things infinitely far away instantly, examples kind of break. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, there's a certain point where I think physicists must just go, screw it. It's what the, it's what the math says, you know? They know they've done the steps right and the calculations deliver the result that they do. And that represents the way the world is, even if it doesn't make any sense to us, right? So... So yeah, but yeah, like Max Planck said, uh, older generation dying off. I mean, and we saw this uh, with the rise of quantum mechanics. Um, uh, Einstein, even though through his discovery of the, the law of the photoelectric effect, which is what he won the Nobel Prize for, that contribution helped open the way to quantum mechanics. So he helped initiate quantum mechanics, but he did not believe in it. Uh, his famous quote, God does not play dice with the universe, right? This was Einstein kind of railing against this quantum randomness that's inherent in quantum physics. And he's just like, I can't have this. Um, but, you know, the older generation died off. Now we have quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is fine. So, okay. So Kuhn's approach uh, was pretty cool. It did a lot to open the way for appreciating uh, the role that philosophy can play, the role that different social and political ideologies, uh, perhaps even religious ideologies, 
can play in cre creating and accepting scientific theories. To continue, just quoting from Duzek on page 14, after Kuhn, numerous philosophers, historians, and sociologists of science took up the issue of how philosophical views, religious views, and social ideologies have played a role in the birth and spread of scientific theories. This in turn strengthens the case for cultural influences on technology. Very interesting. <clears throat> And we will see this as we get deeper into this chapter. Um, I think just um, just after these couple of slides right here. Before we talk about that, um, there are two issues that are sort of raised in this post-positivist philosophy of science after the positivists, Popper, Kuhn, thinkers that like those that we've just been discussing. Oh, here's an interesting question, Holden. <laughs> Can we think of this accumulation of anomalies leading to a new paradigm as similar to a contradiction or antithesis leading to a synthesis in Hegelian dialectics? Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay, I, I don't want, um, uh, you know, I don't see what, okay. As somebody who's, not really that much of a Hegelian, I can see the similarity. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, it's all good. I don't mind talking about Hegel. It's all good. We, we can talk about Hegel. <laughs> Hegel, uh, what an interesting guy. The bane of Schopenhauer's existence. Um, so for those who are not familiar, um, Hegel's got this sort of... Uh, idea of of reason as this sort of world spirit um that manifests itself and unfolds through history and it does so in this process of um of of uh you know the hegelian dialectic um reason in history um it goes uh thesis synthesis uh no thesis antithesis synthesis and this is nicely captured by the German word, which I believe, I mean, Hegel would have used this word, uh, Aufgehaven, which uh, is like, uh, it, it has numerous different meanings, um, but it can mean to, uh, to overcome, uh, to negate, uh, or to affirm. So it kind of nicely describes Hegel's, uh, Hegel's um, dialectic. And this is, this is how Hegel saw the unfolding of reason in history, right? There's a, there's a thesis, then there's an antithesis against that thesis, and then there's a new synthesis. And he thought that this just kind of um, broadly captured um, the uh, the uh, the way that history unfolds, culminating in Hegel's realization of this. Of course, Hegel's one of those uh, Hegel's one of those guys who thought he ended history. So you know, geez, it's been forever since I've talked about Hegel. Um, I, uh, I'm trying, I'm trying, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to uh, make sure I type it correctly because I'm not very proficient in German. So, yeah, okay, I'm going to spell it for you all. Alf. Yeah, Alf Haven. Yeah, you've got it all pretty right. There's just no G. Yeah, Alf Haven. Oh, you've got it. No, no, oh, oh, there are various spellings. Okay. There are various spellings. Yeah. Alf Haven or Alf Haven. <laughs> German's Germans weird. Don't worry about it um it's a, it's an interesting yeah it's an interesting language um but uh it, just know that it means to you know it means numerous things and, and max go ahead you've got your hand up yeah sorry i was just confused is it is it aufheben or aufhebung like which because like aufheben is like the verb conjugation versus aufhebung is like more like the noun yeah uh i think it can be both 
Okay. Um, you, you said it meant like like abolition, revocation, annulment, like invalidation, like a reversal of sorts, right? Yeah. Um, it just, uh, and, and remember, don't quote Wikipedia in anything, but oh, according, yeah, no, no, according no. to Wikipedia, um, is a German word with several seemingly contradictory meanings, including to lift up, to abolish, cancel, to suspend, yeah, or to sublate. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's also been defined as abolish, preserve, and transcend in philosophy, Alfabin is used by Hegel in his Exposition of Dialectics, um, and it may be translated as sublate. Yeah, it's um, yeah that make that makes sense in context. Yeah, because like in I, I, in German, like those words, like they are contradictory, but they're like a bit less contradictory because of like the Alf, um, like part of the word, which is like already contradictory. So yeah yeah you may it, wikipedia is not bad it, it's it's not bad wikipedia is a lot better than it was 20 yeah. years ago when i was oh my god also german is, is I, like the second most used language on wikipedia so oh really i guess yeah. that makes sense though i guess that makes sense i mean it, it is um it's never really been like a lingua franca but it's it but it's but it's a language that a hell of a lot of scholarship has taken place in so yeah that makes sense that's that's really cool um i should learn some more german but uh but yeah i'm i'm just to answer that question yeah i i see where you're going and and i just without being um much of a hegelian i can see where i can see where where yeah i can see what you're talking about but i don't know if kuhn i mean perhaps it's because the similarity is because hegel and kuhn are both are both looking at things from a historical perspective, uh, even though Kuhn is not necessarily a Hegelian, if, if that makes sense. Holden, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I think it, just what I mean is, um, so you have this framework and through a series of contradictions or um, antitheses, changes into something else, um, which gives us a better understanding. And that that kind of continues to, I guess it's any sort of dialectic, that sort of process of reasoning. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of what I, how I understood um, the concept of anomalies um, in this case. But yeah, yeah I'm, they sorry. Would... I'm sorry for even asking that question. Oh, no, no. I understand. <laughs> yeah. This is, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is the kind of thing I want to happen in this class because like, I don't, I don't, I don't, read enough hegel i don't do enough continental stuff and and we have to bring these approaches together in this class so if this happens this is exactly what we're trying to do so that's that's great uh vincente go ahead i hope i'm saying your name correctly it's with like an s so it's vicente vicente okay yeah. awesome yeah. thank you but yeah what i was gonna say it's pretty similar to what you say i believe but when i first read kuhn the example that we would use in class was the the Second World War and like how technology and like literally Hegel was saying that German was going to be like the, the top of the world and the scientific revolution and everything. And it ended up killing themselves and, and, and going into this non-rational thing. Yeah. And, and I feel like this is very different to how Hegel would have explained dialects because it has to be more with like uh, institutions and many other things that Hegel, like he did describe, but he will always go to ideology or like ideas to describe them. Yeah. So, so I feel it's like we can make the comparison now looking at them from our perspective, but I believe Kuhn will be saying like, I'm trying to, to I don't remember the word in, in German, but to overcome or like go over yeah. uh, what Hegel was trying to say and, and not trying to do like the same thing or something. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I think I think the similarity seems to be somewhat superficial um, because because of what I said a moment ago, like I think it's because they were both looking at things from a historical perspective. But if I understand Hegel correctly, like Hegel gets weird with his like um, with a Weltgeist, the world spirit, like this reason, um, like you say, there's a lot of ideology like he'll he'll explain he'll explain things with his master slave sort of uh with thing rather than pointing to to what is actually happening in the world which is what kuhn would do i think 
Kuhn would point to universities and research labs and um, kind of like m m monumental moments in science. Um, so yeah, I think we agree about that. Thank you. Uh, Jonah, go ahead. Uh, I've been I've been on a bit of a, a Hegel binge recently, so um, uh, I'd like to play a little bit of devil's advocate. Um, okay. Uh, when we talk, talk about like Hegel being ideological, there's a lot of historical context to that, where he, basically he thought everything was ideas, and so yeah, and so if you think everything's ideas, there are going to be things that you know universities, institutions, things with that sort of uh, basis. Um, uh, have more ideas coming out of them. They have more power. Like you were talking about the master slave. So institutions um, will have that, a certain power that the things that are not institutions have. And, and what you were saying about um, Kuhn's history, Kuhn's uh, and Hegel's connection with them both viewing history. Um, I think they both have the connection of, of uh, viewing history as the progression towards um, total knowledge or total consciousness. Hmm. Um, and where Hegel takes that a little too far, where he thinks that like, you know, humanity can collectively become the spirit that is God or yeah. something along those lines. Kuhn <laughs> is more like we can get actual scientific knowledge. Yeah. We'll get working paradigms that don't, don't have as many anomalies. That sounds fair. I think that's a fair take. And again, like, I mean, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to say like, I am not, uh, you know, I'm no expert on Hegel. Um, but I mean, I think that's a, I guess that's a fair take, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to make him sound like he was some kind of weird ideologue or anything, uh, even though, uh, a lot of what he says probably sounds strange to us. I mean, maybe if you haven't read like, uh, any of the other German idealists, but, um, yeah, if, it, if it, he's a, he's a, he's a funky guy for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wasn't he, um, he 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 continued lecturing as Napoleon's army was coming over the hill or something, firing their cannons back in the day. He he seemed like an interesting character for sure. Yeah, he he saw that and was like, "Yep, this is what I'm writing about right now." This yeah. is awesome. A real uh, real world historical moment. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh, I geez, what a well. Anyway, <laughs> um, philosophy by cannon fire. So real quick to finish off these slides, I had a whole other set of slides. I don't know if we'll get to get to much of them today, but that's OK, because this discussion has actually been really cool. Uh, and this is exactly what I'm hoping will happen uh, in future classes. Right. But let's talk about two issues that come up in post positive uh, post positive philosophy of science. One issue is the theory laden nature of observation. Right observation obviously if we're going to go out and look at the world and try to understand what it is what we observe will depend on uh the context of not only theory but also interpretation right and we know this now thanks to um you know uh interestingly thanks to psychology which which as i said earlier doesn't actually identify laws um it looks at effects but we know that beliefs and expectations that we have can influence perception. We know that we're susceptible to bias. We know that we're susceptible to perceptual illusion, to misperception, right? And the really cool example that Duzek gives on page 16 uh, is, is to do with, um, you know, this, uh, this uh, medical x-ray fellow or microscope fellow who realized that after uh, staring um, through his school microscope, he wasn't studying a microorganism. He was studying the reflection of his own eyeglass. So, you know, things like the interpretation of medical x-rays or, um, you know, the identification of cell organelles under a microscope, these are not obvious. They involve a heck of a lot of training, right? And this is part of that practice that Kuhn, Kuhn was talking about earlier that isn't actually in any particular theory. Right. It's it's not like if you look up um, various theories of biology, you'll find uh, how to use a microscope. No, that's practice. Right. Or at least it's thought of as practice. There was an example I had here for this. Um, what was it? Oh, yeah. If anyone wants to see 
a really crazy illustration of this. It's not crazy. It's just it's just kind of humorous. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, uh, one thing, one one psychological fact that you know um, maybe isn't theory laden, but which uh, kind of hits the point, uh, kind of gets the point home of um, you know how susceptible we are to being wrong about what we observe is is uh, is uh, is um, you know something phenomena like change blindness or inattentional blindness. And maybe you've seen the monkey business illusion where um, this is often given in first year psychology classes, right? Where you've got a video that's played of a, you know, a blue team and a red team or something, and they're playing basketball. And uh, the students are asked to count the number of passes that the members of one team make to the other. While they're busy doing that, uh, a guy in a gorilla suit comes out and waves and then leaves the stage. And um, most people, if they're focused on counting the passes, do not see it. They don't see the, the guy in the gorilla suit. It's called inattentional blindness. And you can check it out. You can go watch the illusion, um, see if you fall for it. You probably won't now that you know how it works. But I saw this really interesting paper that I was using when I was a teaching assistant um, uh, back in the, the, my grad school days. I was working for uh, Dr. Deepthi Kamawar, who's a psychologist, working for her in her class. And uh, one of her, um, one of the papers that we were required to read was The Invisible Gorilla Strikes Again inattentional blindness in, you know, um, oncologists or something. They had uh, inserted uh, in, into all these x-ray images of lungs, they had inserted a little in gorilla uh, into these x-ray images. And um, these oncologists and radiologists in, in the study were asked to identify like cancerous tumors in uh in these um in these x-ray slides which some of them succeeded that uh but all of them missed the gorilla so i think that really hits the point home you know the interpretation of medical x-rays even by experts is not obvious right um uh we are so so susceptible to missing things to making mistakes um, because of biases and certain perceptual phenomena. So I don't know. I just thought I'd mention that because I think it's a cool example. Um, but aside from the scientific theories themselves, there, you know, nowadays things are equipment wise, observation wise, things are so complicated that we also have theories concerning the workings of the scientific tools that we use, the instruments we use for observation. Theory plays a role in what we decide to observe and how we talk about it. Uh, space nerds, if you're a space nerd like me, um, we just launched the James Webb Space Telescope, right? It's way better than the Hubble Telescope. So cool, it's a tool for observation. But that tool for observation depends on other scientific theory, right? Even, even optical telescopes do. Right. Even if just if I have an optical telescope like Hubble was an optical telescope or if I have an optical telescope on my backyard and I just go and look at the moon or something. I mean, that instrument depends on more theory. It depends on how optics work. Right. So uh, and, and theory, of course, also plays a role in what we decide to look at and how we talk about it. Maybe we'll use the James Webb Space Telescope to. Uh, to, to, to try and find phenomena that will help us um, uh, verify or falsify some theory, right? Where we turn our instruments depends on what predictions our theories are making and how we want to test them. So, you know, as Duzik puts it, even when perceptual observation has been replaced by machine observation, these latter influences of theory on the nature and structure obser of observation reports remain. So. That's the theory-laden nature of observation. What's next? Let's have a look. Ah, I must get a, speaking of technology, I need a new computer.
gosh darn it. Ah, the underdetermination thesis, right. So this is kind of related to the problem of induction. It's kind of related to Duhem's thesis. Uh, basically, it goes like this. We can have different theories. Maybe we have an original theory, and then we have a slightly modified version of that theory, and they can explain the same data set, right? Now, the problem is that verification or induction doesn't lead to one unique theory. Often it leads to different competing theories that can explain the same data set. Or even if we're not talking about, a, strictly speaking, a data set, something like um, just general findings, like the fossil record. I've got this very famous example that I like to use. Uh, we look at the fossil record, we see that life changes, right? It evolves and it changes. There are many more creatures that have gone extinct than creatures that exist today. And we know that things evolve. We've, we've got lots of evidence for that besides fossils. But how do things evolve? Does it happen fast or slow? Stephen Jay Gould, famous paleontologist, advocated a theory called punctuated equilibrium to explain uh, so-called gaps in the fossil record, you know, so-called missing links. Why are there missing links? Well, it's because changes happen fast when the, uh, when the equilibrium changes, when the environment suddenly changes, you know. Think of a cataclysmic event, like, say, um, the asteroid, which led to the extinction of the dinosaurs and the rise of uh, birds and mammals. Well, I guess now technically birds are just dinosaurs, right? That's cool. That's another, that's another example of how things change. When I was young, Pluto was a planet and birds were descended from dinosaurs. Now, Pluto is not a planet and birds are dinosaurs, which is awesome. Um, but anyway, that, that's, that's another example. But Punctuated Equilibrium by Stephen Jay Gould says that things change quickly when the equilibrium, the, the environment, the balancing the environment changes. And that's what causes selection for different traits and new species to emerge. And there was a very famous debate uh, throughout the 90s between Gould with punctuated equilibrium and Richard Dawkins with his climbing mountain probable analogy, where, uh, no, there aren't sudden fast changes. It's very, very, very slow incremental changes. And uh, what look like gaps are not like quick leaps in evolution, but just gaps. We just don't have the fossil record. And that's, that's it, right? So these are two different theories that are trying to explain the same thing, right? Uh, that's, my, that's my example that I like to use. The point here is that considerations besides empirical evidence play a role in theory selection, right? What are you going to pick? Punctuated equilibrium, climbing mountain probable. Well, you might appeal to other principles besides uh, other, you know, instead of empirical evidence. If two theories explain the data equally well, maybe you want to go for the simpler theory, the more elegant theory. Uh, and this is, of course, the principle of parsimony, otherwise known as Occam's razor. Occam's razor is usually quoted as saying, uh, you know, the simplest answer is the correct one. That's not actually what it says. What William of Ockham actually said was, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. You know, don't make up more stuff to explain what you're seeing. Use the theory where you need the least assumptions, where you need to posit the fewest assumptions. That's the principle of parsimony. You might also uh, go for consistency with other theories, right? Uh, I've got two competing theories to try to explain this data. Well, which theory fits best within the paradigm with all of the other theories, right? Um, so this is the underdetermination thesis. And we'll see as we make our way through the book that it features in the work of sociologists of technology, which I think we're going to have to talk about next time. Um, and also by postmodernists who study science and technology. And I'm really curious to get to this. Um, well, I'm not a, I'm not like one of those uh, ana like hardcore analytic philosophers who thinks continental philosophy is dumb. Um, I also don't know that I completely understand what postmodernism is, is, is all about. I, I suppose I understand it as skepticism about meta-narratives. 
or even just narratives. Um, if that's the case, I guess I'm really looking forward to see how they study science and technology. Because those are full of narratives. Um, anyway, we'll see. <laughs> I never thought I'd be excited to learn about postmodernism, but here I am teaching this class. This is fun. All right. So um, I thought we were going to get past this uh, this uh, bit uh, that um, that I left uh, left out of last lecture. I thought we would get past this and well into the rest of chapter one, but it looks like we're going to be finishing chapter one next time because it's 1249 right now. But that's fine. Um, as I said um, earlier, uh, let's get all this stuff out of the way. As I said on the, I think it was the first class, I really think it would be cool if we get uh, lots of interesting discussion going here, even though this is a large class. I think I've got about 120 students, but only uh, 50 or 60 of you are showing up to the live lecture. And I think that's a uh, good enough size that we can get good, good discussion happening like we did today. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Zach, you should start a pool. Um, yeah, and see how much of the book we finish. I mean, um, I think I want to just get as far as we can. If we could at least get to like phenomenology and hermeneutics and stuff, I think I'd be happy with that. But, uh, but we'll see. But yeah, place your bets, everyone. Place your bets. Um, but yeah, we'll just go as far as we can. Uh, I, I personally think that we all get more out of the material when we talk about the ideas than we do when I'm just blah, 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 just talking at you. Um, I really don't like doing that. I want students to participate. I want you guys to, to ask me questions uh, that, that maybe I don't know the answer to. I, that's what I want out of this. I'm here to learn just like you are. So maybe we'll get 60%. Dula, I hope we get 70%. I really do. Um, but I suppose time will tell. Then again, some chapters are shorter than others. So yeah. Oh, that's great, Max. I'm glad you enjoyed the discussion. And, you know, by the way, if there's anything that I'm kind of stumped by, um, I'm, hey, you're an optimist. That's good. Yeah, if there's anything I'm, I'm stumped by, uh, I'll, go and, I'll go and check it out, and do my homework. I think, uh, I think for today, I'm probably going to go have to go brush up on my Hegel. I haven't read Hegel since undergrad. And let's be honest, even when I was an undergrad, I wasn't reading Hegel very closely. I was, you know, I might not have been that good of an undergrad. Jeez, I don't know. I should have read more, um, but whatever. I've, I, I, I made it. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm babbling on here. I have to go um, shovel some more snow. Uh, and it's 12.52, so it's pretty much time to wrap up. So I will get this um, get this video uploaded to the YouTube channel for those who weren't able to make it today. Um, oh, thanks for the tip, Max. Oh, that's really cool. I will do that. Uh, I, I admit, like, like, I don't really have any, have very much knowledge of German. Um, what little I have is from, like, reading, you know how you can get philosophy books that have the translation and then the original so like I have some with Greek here and English here uh, when I was reading um, I was reading a lot of Wittgenstein back in the day and and I the copy of the investigations that I had was um, German and English so I could kind of go back and forth and do it that way uh, but I've lost a lot of the words I picked up so so thank you for that thank you for that Max uh, I will check that out. And, and yeah, if, if we, we talk about Alfaben or... <laughs> Aha, I see what you did there. <laughs> Danke. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, and you know, we're going to be reading, uh, we're going to be reading about Husserl, Heidegger, um, probably more Hegel, Marx. So, you know, a German translator might not be, might not be the, um, the, ba the, the worst idea. Oh, and you found Alf Haben on, that's great. I can't seem to, oh, well, anyway, my computer's slow, but as people are starting to leave, uh, so goodbye, everybody. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, there it is, to pick, to cancel, to make void.
Uh, that's awesome to make void. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yes, happy. Yes, happy shoveling to anyone else who has to who has to dig themselves out. We'll see you next time, everyone. Awesome. Oh, that sucks. All right. Cheers, everybody. Bye for now.